Thank you all for moving down front and you can continue to do so. There are still some seats available and I know Libby would appreciate that for her presentation. Um, as Nancy mentioned, I'm Bonnie Hunter, Vice President for Student Affairs here at Valparaiso University. And I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for today, Libby Roderick. I will say that it isn't often that one gets to meet an international singer, songwriter, and recording artist, or a native Alaskan for that matter. And perhaps you don't meet a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Yale every day either. But Libby Roderick is a combination of all of those things. And I understand from one of our staff members who took his four small children and Libby to the dunes last night, she is also great with children. There are pictures to prove it, right, Matt? <laughs> but Libby has done so many things. Her music has been featured on CNN's Anderson Cooper 360, on CBS's 60 Minutes, and in the New York Times, among other places. And her music has been heard around the world. NASA has even played it on the planet Mars. You can hear it too. If you get a few minutes in between sessions, go to YouTube. It is excellent. She's received numerous accolades, but the accolades aren't just for her music. She has been the co-author or editor of numerous books and articles, including Start Talking, a handbook for engaging difficult dialogues in higher education. Stop Talking, Indigenous Ways of Teaching and Learning and Difficult Dialogues in Higher Education. Toxic Friday, Resources for Addressing Faculty Bullying in Higher Education. And Alaska Native Cultures and Issues. She conducts workshops for faculty across the US and in South Africa on engaging difficult dialogues in the classroom, indigenous ways of teaching and learning, leadership development, addressing faculty bullying in higher education, teaching climate change across the curriculum, culturally responsive teaching, and more. And she is the director of the Difficult Dialogues Initiative at the University of Alaska Anchorage and vice president of the National Difficult Dialogues Resource Center. In addition, she has a true depth of understanding of the subject matter that we have been discussing for the past few days. In short, she is an excellent choice for our conference on dialogue and understanding. I think we will learn a lot from this warm, genuine, and incisive person. Thank you, Libby, very much for joining us. And please welcome Libby Roderick. Well, as everybody knows, it's always sort of mortifying to come up after an introduction like that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, and I promise you, it, my response to dealing with the climate crisis in Alaska has been to attend comedy improv at every chance that I get. And so I know the impulse to refuse to come to the front because someone will pick on you in some way. I, I won't. I just. I'm a performer and I really, when I particularly, when we do something like this, which will be more like a workshop than a keynote, um, I just really want us together. So um, also like to thank, of course, my gracious hosts, Nancy and Cassie and Michelle and Diane and Matt and all the people who have made my stay here so lovely. Mr. President, nice to have you here with us. Um, also, would very much like to thank Mother Nature for thinking about this born and raised Alaska and then keeping the temperatures somewhere in the zone. Um, the angels of Mother Nature's better nature are serving me well. I uh, made it to sleep last night at 11 p.m. The problem was it was 11 p.m. Alaska time. So if I occasionally drop a stitch, please treat me kindly. Um, I was thinking about that because I did go to South Africa a couple times running because one of the universities there wanted to replicate the difficult dialogues model that we developed at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, and as you might imagine, it's quite a set of entanglements. And when I arrived there, after 48 hours of travel coming from Alaska, as far away as I could possibly go on the planet, and as you probably know, it was 11 hours different, so it was literally turned upside down in terms of my timing. I was a bit of a zombie, and I stood there actually saying to myself, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? This is hard work. 
This is some of the hardest work in the world in South Africa. I am a white woman. I'm a white woman from Alaska, and I am so exhausted I can barely see. And I luckily kept my mouth shut, and John Samuels, who had been uh, education minister under Nelson Mandela, got up to speak to his faculty and administrators in the room and gave one of the most lyrical, impassioned, extraordinary speeches, I guess I would say, about the extraordinary need to embed the habits of democracy in each new generation, lest they be lost to a despot. And this was, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, and I said to them, you know, we're in the same boat. And this was eight years ago, right? So I so appreciate what you do, is what I'm saying. I think the people that I work with who do this work wherever I go are some of the finest leaders that we have in the country. And so I am thrilled to have you here. So um, I'm gonna charge through a lot of stuff here um, because I want to give you both a bit of an overview as well as actual hands-on strategies. We're gonna do stuff. Uh, Elizabeth, I think, was saying people are hungry for actual things that they can take away, so we're going to actually do some of those things. Most of the folks I work with across the country and elsewhere are faculty, and I know some of you are and some of you aren't, some of you are both. Um, so these um, are mostly um, in-classroom strategies, but they are transferable to other venues, and um, I hope useful in that way. So um, I'm gonna just jump on in. Uh, some of these may be new to some of you. Some of you may be using them already. Um, so hang in there with me. Uh, the very first one just disappeared. There we go. You probably call them listening dyads. You might call them think pair share. You might call them listening pairs or something else. This is a deceptively simple strategy. I have taught 16 week courses on this strategy. Um, and it, it's been employed here a couple times in different ways, and so I will teach it the way that I teach it to you, and then I'll talk about why it's so important. I've used it everywhere in international conferences to uh, around the family dinner table. So here's how I teach it, and um, as I think it was also Elizabeth, somebody was saying earlier, um, teaching people to teach, that's what I'm doing, right? So I'll talk you through some of my thinking process as well. So what I say to, people is think of somebody you wildly admire and respect. Might be somebody in this room, might be Martin Luther King, might be your mom. I got somebody, I hope. What I'm gonna invite you to do is listen to somebody near you with the level of attention and respect that you would accord Albert Einstein, if that was your person, or Mother Teresa, or whomever it was that you thought of, to your listening partner, because there's a lot of information um, suggesting that the quality of people's thinking is directly impacted by the quality of the attention that we provide them for that thinking. And given that our decisions are based on our thinking, um, it's really important, and particularly given what we do, to provide spaces in which people uh, are given very high quality of attention to do their best thinking and to do, hopefully, new thinking, at least new to them. So you, as the listener, are critical to them rising up to that opportunity. So, for example, the difference between um, attending to someone as if they are the genius that they are and listening for genius and authenticity as opposed to listening like that uh, directly impacts the quality of the thinking. So that's how I teach it. And I say to people, I'm gonna give you, in this case, a very short period of time because of what I'm trying to do. But in this case, I'm just gonna give you a minute apiece one person starts, one person agrees to be the listener. The listener is asked to listen with that quality of attention, to not interrupt, to listen, as our native elders would say, without agenda. You're not going to be called on to respond. You are there to have the extraordinary pleasure of getting to witness another person's intelligence and what they do with their mind. It might be very different than what you do with your mind. Um, some people will choose to do nothing, stay in silence, do nothing. Uh, being silent does not mean people are not thinking. So if they choose to be quiet, then you stay there attending to them with great respect. Um, and, um, and I'm gonna ask you to be mindful of your nonverbals, okay? So many of us are accustomed to listening like this, right? That's okay, but just be mindful of how you listen to somebody else, okay, in terms of your nonverbal expressions. And the reason for that is that we lead people. 
that people pay attention to. Most of communication is nonverbal. Right? So they are watching your response to them, particularly students, and they will move towards approval. And the minute that they notice that you aren't approving, they notice. And we can't afford that these days. We really need to allow people to do their own thinking, particularly folks who haven't been given a lot of airspace. So with that, I'm going to invite you to find someone. I know this disrupts those of you who are eating. I'm sorry. Um, and you may have to actually go to another table. Um, and I'm going to give you a minute apiece. So pick somebody to start. And then I'm going to need you to pay attention, because at a certain point, I'm going to call the time. I will say something. I will raise my hand. The minute you see it, please raise your hand so that you register that you heard me. Other people will see your hand go up. And then close up gently your thoughts. You don't have to hack it off, right? But gently close it up, and we'll switch to the other person. And it's an invitation. Um, you can think about whatever you want during your turn, always. But I'm inviting you, and you've been invited before, to think about the difficult dialogues that are the most salient on your campus or in your classes or the ones that should be happening, right, that aren't. I call them difficult silences. Okay, any questions, everybody good? Okay, sorry we don't have more time, but we're gonna at least have an abridged experience. So grab a dance partner, I'm gonna give you a minute apiece, and launch. Okay, great, thank you for doing that. Um, I think we have time to do this. I'm going to ask you repeatedly during this session to share your insights and thoughts, questions, whatever you've got. There is a microphone there. There is a microphone there. Um, is anyone, uh, that was very short, I know, but willing and wishing to share anything about what it was like to be the listener? I need to check. I know many of you probably weren't able to pull it off quite the way I said it. It's not a discussion. Right? There's not interaction between parties. We're actually making a sacred space for someone to be one hopes heard or feel heard. Uh, I'm loud enough, I can talk. Um, <laughs> I think I was critiquing myself based on the things that you had said about this thing, and I was talking to him and I was shaking my head a little bit, and I stopped because mm. I knew I shouldn't be shaking my head. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Super important. Thank you very much. Other folks? Um, I, found, I found myself doing a little of the same, except um, I was noticing uh, my partner, and as I was listening and, and noticing, like you were saying, um, I was I was trying not to give approval, mm -hmm. and I was noticing how she was navigating the conversation, and I was wondering if it would have been different had I been nodding ah. and approval. But um, uh, and I think you know I was, I was able to still listen, but just kind of notice how how she was navigating that that difference. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Somebody over here. Oh, nice. It's, uh, yeah, it was a nice personal connection. I think I would have focused on the content only. The Wonderful, thank you. We have one more, maybe, for you. Um, how about folks, what, what it was like to, um, what did I just ask you, to be listened to? You're all so used to it, it happens all the time. <laughs> 
she was a great listener, but she was like looking in my eyes. And I'm not used to that really. Like people kind of look everywhere, you know, you're talking, people kind of go this way and that way. And she was looking very deeply at me and it was kind of threw me off a little bit. Right. And so I was trying to sound really smart, you know, because she was looking really so hard. But um, she did a great job. Gotcha. Don't even have to try. Um, anybody else just want to reflect a wee bit on that role? It's hard to, and I know my family would laugh at this, but um, it's hard to like talk for that amount of time without, like you find yourself kind of pausing to let the other person kind of say something in response. And so it's kind of hard to be like, oh, okay, well I said that, okay, well then I can say that. And then I, you know, you find yourself kind of like making your point or saying your thing and then wanting to pause. Gotcha, gotcha. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. There's so much here I can barely know where to start, but I also wanted to point out that I waited a little bit for someone to rise up. In, um, one of the things we learn in indigenous teaching and learning is the pedagogical value of silence and waiting, pausing. because all of the Western educational research confirms that the longer you wait, the higher the quality of the responses your students give you. Every student achievement metric goes through the roof the longer you wait. And when they do the research, they show that most of us in a faculty position think we're waiting 12 seconds, and we're waiting between 1.2 and 2 seconds. So thank you for all those comments. There's a lot to, to say about each one of them. Um, had something I did want to actually say. Oh, um, that we don't teach people how to listen, right? We teach people how to speak. But in difficult dialogues, I would, I would p postulate that the listening is possibly the most important role. Because until people are heard, nothing shifts, pretty much. So, there's so much more to say, and each one of you made comments that I could comment about, um, but uh, for the time being, just, just um, the awareness that we are trained to leap in, we're trained to have social conversations, we're trained to argue, we're trained to talk, um, but we're not actually trained to receive and genuinely hear or try to hear what somebody else is saying and give them the space they need to do it. We often aren't trained to listen and give them the space to think new thoughts or to even think their own thoughts. Um, so it's super, super important. And I drop these in all the time. Uh, there is also research, I know some of you know it better than I do. Um, I think the research on attention span for students has dropped from something like 20 minutes down to 10, maybe it's down to five, partly due to the technology, of course. And so lecturing is fabulous. I think lecturing is fantastic. I've seen some brilliant lectures. I saw one this morning. Um, I think they're marvelous. I also think we can build in pausing into our lectures to allow people to think what they choose to. And that we need to think that if, if you think you're going to talk for 45 minutes straight, most people are going to get lost. They aren't going to stay with you. So I build these in regularly. Now, as difficult dialogues happen, I build them in regularly. And they are highly structured. They're not conversations. Because people may differ wildly. And we have to learn to make space to listen to that person's thinking without judging every piece of it, reflecting it back, jumping in, arguing with, okay? So there's a, a lot to this one. Um, let's see, do. So one of them is that no matter how big your group, everybody in the group has been heard. And that changes the dynamic in the group completely. If they've been heard by just one person, I've done this with hundreds of people at a time. Every single person in that room has been heard by someone. Changes the game in terms of difficult dialogues. It drops the volatility level immediately and it ups the connection level quickly and immediately. And it doesn't take much time. Most of the strategies that I teach faculty have a very aware of the time pressures on faculty that we can't derail the whole class every single time something comes up. We need to find ways that are time aware. Um, what was the other point I wanted to make about that? Um, I won't. So, but you can also use it in 
in private discussions, if you, if you are in an argument with somebody else, you take five minutes, I take five minutes. You take five minutes, I take five minutes. You take five minutes, I take five minutes. And I have witnessed entire conflicts resolve because once people begin to feel like they're being heard, they can listen to somebody else and you begin to find commonalities that way. It models equal time. Most of our difficult dialogues are about power, privilege, identity issues, and one of the most common aspects, particularly for white folks, is we take up too much airtime. Men, similar, right? Whenever you're in the dominant group, you assume too much airtime. This models, at least on that smaller level, equal time. It allows folks who come from cultures or individual personalities an opportunity to organize their thoughts. You get into volatile discussions, stakes go up, gets harder to talk. It's hard enough for many p students to talk in the first place in our campuses, particularly if they come from particular kinds of cultures like my indigenous folks do, where you are actively taught not to compete and jump in. Right? So it gives the quieter folks a chance to organize what they, want, uh, what they want to share in the conversation. It gives people a chance to process emotions. I remember being in an international conference of, with women in the Netherlands, I think it was, looking at women's policies and the policy of reproductive rights came up and the Irish women had a divergent viewpoint from the majority and uh, there was a lot of emotion around the topic. Right? And so we would do this every 10 minutes or so so people could have a sacred space, nobody else was commenting on it, where they got to have feelings about what was being said so that they then didn't bring them all raw into the discussion and help people think again. Right? And most important, it gives somebody in my role a time out. If stuff starts going crazy and I think, I don't know what to do, I say, everybody get to listening pairs, <laughs> right? And that's a real, really necessary strategy if you're in these kind of dialogues sometimes, right? Buys you time to figure out your next step while people are getting a chance to process their own thoughts, okay? Um, so. I'm going to keep moving here and head into a wee bit of an overview of where I'm coming from. Um, many of you may know about this already, but in uh, 2005, the Ford Foundation issued an RFP to all accredited institutions across the U.S. under the title The Difficult Dialogues Initiative. This was a response to 9-11 when they were hearing from their campuses that there were these rising racial tensions, religious tensions, attacks on academic freedom and so forth all across the country. So they put out a bunch of grants uh, in an effort to protect academic freedom and religious, cultural, and political pluralism on our campuses. These are the topics folks tackled uh, most. Fundamentalism, secularism, race and ethnic relations, Middle East, religion, sexual orientation, academic freedom. And they went at it through a whole host of portals, right? Curriculum development, pedagogy, faculty development, which is where I spent most of my time, student programs, and some fabulous interactive theater programs. Uh, these were some of the initial programs, some of which are still going, some of which have fallen by the wayside. Um, Ford um, ended the funding for that and most of its other programs in 2008 with the crash, and they sort of restructured everything. Um, but I'll just give you a few of them. Portland Community College has a fantastic social justice theater program uh, that is tied to a year-long sociology course on oppression. They surface some of the issues that they experience on campus in their own lives. They play them out in interactive theater things for other students. The students are invited to get up and help shape the endings, change the endings. Um, it's a terrific program. Barnard uh, used the Reacting to the Past, which is a role playing, a game that you may already know about, to look at the Middle East issues that they were dealing with on their campus and are still actively dealing with, of course. Emory had a transforming community project that created a common record of race at Emory. They did photographs, oral histories, narratives, and so on. And this amazing thing, they had the first and only slavery and the university histories and legacies conference in 2011. Pretty amazing. University of Texas at Austin has a terrific program where they develop difficult dialogues courses. In those courses, the faculty teach not only the subject matter, but also how do you engage in difficult dialogues in a civil and respectful way, and what is the role and responsibilities around academic freedom in the classroom. Those are some of their topics that they tackle. 
University of Michigan, you probably know about the program on intergroup relations. They have, uh, they teach over a long period of time, face-to-face -face meetings between students from different social groups that have a history of conflict or potential conflict. Um, it's co-facilitated, it's graded, and so on. And they do a conference every year. If you're interested, you can send folks to it. It's quite a remarkable program, been going on over 25 years. They also have a summer youth dialogues on race and ethnicity gathering in Detroit and um, the Summer Institute I just mentioned, which is happening coincident with this one. And then we have ours. Um, we have three pieces to our Difficult Dialogues program. The first, she's mentioned them <laughs> in her introduction. Um, and they each have a book, book attached and one has also a film. Start talking, the one I'm working with you on today, we had several five-day faculty trainings. Uh, introducing faculty to a wide range of strategies for proactively introducing controversial topics into the classroom. We have a Books of the Year program that is along the lines of what you're talking about, the critical reflection work you do here. We use a text as that third uh, focal point on a range of topics uh, to talk about difficult dialogues. And then we have a handbook of best practices. It is free to you online. Um, looks like this. It is built for, it's a field manual, it's been tested, our faculty use it. You can look up strategies that you need, they're described in here. There's reflections by faculty uh, about what they tried in the classroom, how it went, how it didn't go. Um, and uh, if you have a system-wide need for it, I will send you a copy. We'll put a, we'll get a list going of folks who have beyond a personal use for the book. And I will see if I can get you a copy. Um, Stop talking has already been mentioned. We also had week-long uh, trainings for our faculty, our non-native faculty. Our, uh, it was guided and shaped by native educators and thinkers. Um, and we ended up with e-portfolios. You can go look at them online, what our faculty did with that work, as well as the book is free to you online um, if you want to download that. Um, the indigenous work is remarkable, in my opinion. I'm just going to give you the teeniest flavor here teeniest, teeniest. Um, when we look at our educational missions, when we look at our educational practices and our cultures, one of the little pieces quickly that we look at is that we have very different values as a rule in the way we go about life. So in the work we dig into what that means um, pretty deeply. And of course, the, the column on the left is not descriptive of us, of course. It is sort of descriptive of the Western dominant culture. It's not always true on the ground in any particular university like this one. Um, and the indigenous values are often reflective of collectivist cultures in general. They're just not limited to indigenous cultures, of course, right? But this is a little tiny prompt for discussion. Uh, we look at some indigenous ways of teaching um, that involve things that are very similar to some of what we're used to in a Western context and some of which are very different, including things like storytelling and dance, learning from elders, learning directly from nature as our text, and so on. It's quite remarkable and transformative work for faculty. It brings very ancient ideas and freshens up what people are doing in their classroom. And we look at difficult dialogues, of course, of the legacy of institutional racism, as well as the belly of the beast in this one, which is the way we practice Western science and research. Um, and beginning to have those very difficult dialogues. And the last component, as she mentioned earlier, was where I kept going around doing these workshops with faculty and they'd say, that's terrific, thanks for the resource, thanks for the skills, whatever, but that is not where the most difficult dialogues are in my career, right? They're in my department with my colleagues. What do I do, right? Please give me something. And for a long time I said, please leave me alone, I don't even want to touch that one, right? I don't have anything. Um, and then sort of bucked up. And, um, so we did a very interesting project. We, we invited a woman who has um, written interactive theater scripts around, gender, uh, around implicit bias in faculty hiring for the University of Missouri. They have a terrific script. If you have any access to actors, um, it's a great way to go at that topic. 
she came and interviewed our faculty, faculty in uh, Missouri, faculty in Austin, HR people, union people, and created a script that demonstrates the most common forms of faculty bullying and toxic behavior in departments, and we turned it into a movie. Um, and when you get the book, I wish I could give you this for free, I can't, but the, um, it ties you, it gives you a password to the film, which is then used for discussions. The book is a discussion guide. It has all the background, it has questions, it has all the script, it has everything you need to host discussions, particularly faculty to faculty, but not only, about that issue. Uh, we have debates and faculty forums. Uh, we have a website. Welcome to all those. And um, just before I launch us into our next exercise, anybody want to say anything about any of that? If you're still awake after lunch. Yes, please. Or, yeah, yeah. Example of faculty bullying, the three most common things she unearthed in the interviews were yelling, sending critical slash vicious emails and BCEing other people, and invading personal space. There are many others. Those are overt ones. There's a lot of covert ones, withholding information, not inviting people to things, right? Giving them a workload that's unfair, right? Not carrying your own share of the workload. I know nobody here has had any experiences with anybody doing any of this, but it happens to be somewhat endemic in higher education, as well as, unfortunately, in our workplaces in general. So. Anything else? Yeah. It doesn't have to be a question that you can answer now, but um, in the list between the Western and the mm. Yeah. I'm struck by the fast pace versus the earth-based pace. Yeah. Pretty much everything on the right-hand column is difficult to attain in because we are matching our behavior to the economy, and we're in an economy that's tied to computers at this point. So you'll be rewarded for all the things on the left, and it's very difficult to move in the other direction as much as most of us want on some level. So I hear you. Okay, speaking of fast pace, <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> dash along. <laughs> Okay, so I know many of you, if not most of you, have done this, participated in this in some way, but if there are two strategies that I leave people with, or I hope you take away, the first one would be the listening pairs that can be used anywhere at any time to good effect. It, you know, in the middle of a huge uproar, right? If you split people up into listening pairs, things will go better after. Um, this is the other one, right? Some sort of guidelines for discussion before the discussion happens. Um, some kind of guidelines you might even have at the beginning of the year with people on your campus before anything happens about how things will go when things happen, right? Um, it can be done right before the discussion. It can be done at the beginning of a semester if, you, if your whole class is involving interesting topics that might become volatile. Um, and so I teach it in a particular way. Other people have other ways of doing it, but I am a believer that the hotter the topic, the tighter the structure. Um, the tighter the agreements that you have beforehand, everything will go much better. So here's how we do it. I'm gonna ask you to do a super abridged version of this at your table. If you don't have enough people at your table, invite other people to join you. Um, I do it like this. I ask people to uh, get into groups of three to five people and make two lists. One list is thinking back on discussions you've participated in that have gone well. What did people do to make them go well? Behaviors that they displayed that made the discussion successful. And what did people do in discussions that did not go so well? What are the behaviors that they did that you don't wish other people to do in this discussion? Right? So you come up with two lists. So I'm going to give you five minutes. I want you to try to make sure everybody gets to say something. And do your best in a crazily abridged time to come up with two lists of behaviors, the ones you want people to do and the ones you don't. If I could have your focus, la la. Okay, so 
super abridged. Uh, you can do one of these things for five minutes, you can do them for five weeks, you can do them for five semesters, whatever you need to do. Um, but let me just start with, um, if, if I were doing this in an ordinary setting, I would be sitting here with a whiteboard, and I would say, group number one, um, what do you have to contribute to the what we want people to do behaviors? Give me one or two. Shout them out. Listen. Listen. Great. Okay. What's another one? Check in with others. Check in with others. Do, 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 do. Okay. But um, uh, you all over there. I don't have a number for your table. You all who are not looking at me at all. Yeah, you. <laughs> you were saying to own what you're saying, but not to ascribe character to what other people are saying, to listen to their ideas, but not make assumptions about who they are. OK, listen to people's ideas, but don't make assumptions about their character and who they are. OK? Somebody back there. Yeah. Put away technology. Mm. Okay. And know that we're di diverse in ways that uh, others may not understand. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, other shout. Uh, two comments. One is not going well when people direct all their comments to the leader. Okay, so. Not to one another. Let's, are we, let's, let's only be on the go well. Well, that's okay. We'll put that one over here. Don't just direct your comments to the leader, direct it to the whole community, okay? Okay, great. Allow people to finish their thoughts at their own pace. Okay, how about something you don't want people to do? Your table. Uh, we don't want a conversation where folks are pressured or rushed. Um, and we don't want people to go on tangents away from the focus of conversation. Okay, great, thank you. Your table, what you do not wish people to do. Way in the back there. Uh, talk over other people. Great, okay. Something else from there, too? Okay, yeah, don't check out. Okay, thanks. All right, how about your table? Either, either column, would you want to throw in something? And when I give instructions, I ask people, don't, and you haven't, don't repeat something, add something new to the list. In the good list, we have um, a sense of humor. So nice. Knowing when that's appropriate. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Anybody else here? Um, for the do not list, um, making personal anecdotes that are not relevant. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Stick to the topic, please. Uh, your group. So, um, for the desirable behavior that was to have a goal, a shared goal, but to stay focused on that goal. Oh, okay. For <coughs> undesirable behavior was um, too loud. Okay, all right. Quickly, you either of these tables throw in something? Uh, yeah. Don't eye roll. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Good one. Always a conversation enhancer. Okay, how about somebody here at this table? We've crossed a lot of. Uh, don't engage in belittling or dis dismissive behavior. Okay. Sometimes we have just that. Um, <laughs> I figured. Uh, Defensive or hostile body language, I think, has been said. And, and essentially stubbornness, not being willing to, to change those positions. Okay, all right. And one from you. Uh, lack of being prepared for the meeting. It's ah. not supposed to be done. Right? Okay, don't want people to come unprepared. Great, thank you. So you get a sense, right, of what comes out. Now, every group is, is different. And what's important is that you're setting up rules of engagement for this group, not for every group that's ever met on the planet. Um, so, for example, at this point, if I had time, if I didn't, we wouldn't, I would dig in a little bit more. Somebody said, um, don't get loud, okay? That doesn't happen in certain areas on the East Coast, for example, where that is a sign of passionate engagement. People raise their voices, they get very involved, and if, in fact, if you don't, they will suspect you are disengaging, right? But here, it would be different, maybe. We would have that conversation. Some people might say, well, I come from a different background. I'm going to get passionate about it. And they'd say, okay, let's, you know, we'll, we'll hear about that. And you'd hear that they come from a different place and it means something different. We'd have that discussion. Somebody said, listen. I would say, what does that look like? Right? What's the behavior that indicates you're listening? In my dominant culture, you know, white folks, 
European ancestry folks, a demonstration of respect is to look you in the eyes when you're talking. And somebody said, somebody's looking at me right in the eyes, right? <laughs> um, that's what I was taught, right? But I come from also Yupik country, where that is a sign of disrespect. You do not stare at people, particularly elders. So the sign of respect is to listen with your nonverbals that you're with them and often side to side, but do not look right at them. So somebody might raise that in our context, right? So it's different for every group. That's what's important about it. The other thing that's super important about it, particularly with students, is that we're asking students to create this code of conduct, not the faculty member. And students care more about what their peers think about them, honestly, than they do about what the faculty member thinks about them um, in a different way. Um, and, um, and don't feel put upon, like someone has told them how to behave, um, but that their peers are saying, you know, we paid for this education. We want a learning environment in which we can learn. Please don't come late all the time, right? So then I will ask them to talk about what should be done if people don't respect the agreements that we've just put together. And they have a go at that. And that's always very interesting as well. And students tend to be more draconian, right? Where I have to say, no, I won't chop off their hand when they brought in the cell phone, right? We have another. Um, so the, it's an advisory uh, vote at that point. But, um, but the, it, it takes care of about 80, I'm pulling a statistic out of nowhere, right? I'm gonna say 80% of the problems that might arise. Uh, in fact, we were talking about it in the session yesterday where somebody had a student that was being really a, a, appalling in their classroom. And when they discover that their, their peers don't want them to do that, it's really, really different, right? So um, again, this is super abridged. We could go on and on about this. Um, but um, I encourage people to then display their code on Blackboard or whatever platform you have in the room, re-mention it, refer to it. When somebody does something that goes slightly astray, mostly the students will do it. They'll come in and say, hey, we said, don't interrupt people, let them take the time they need. You know, and you'd have to negotiate that one given the time you have. Some people can talk a lot, right? Um, but, um, and then go back to it, say, well, do we need to change it? You know, we've now had 18 dialogues about race relations on this campus and we've seen how they've gone. Let's go back and talk about what we said we were gonna do. Anybody need to tweak it at this point, okay? I've seen faculty members use it as an assignment. You know, in business ethics, what would it have been like if Enron had had and, and followed a code of conduct? How would that have been different, right? I've seen people use it in sociology classes. How do you build norms in a culture? This is how we do it. You could do it on a Wikipedia, a wiki, wiki thing, where people are constantly adding and commenting, right? So um, we will move on, uh, but um, there are a couple of quick things I wanted to add. I talk to faculty mostly, as I said, so I encourage them to add their baselines. They can add them at the beginning or at the end. They are the person responsible for the learning environment. So if students don't put certain things in there that must be put in there, in, in their opinion, they get to, of course. Uh, they get to discuss how they're treated also as part of this if they want. But, um, and they can take things out if, if students say, you know, something that's not going to happen in that classroom. They, they are in negotiation with the students, but it changes the entire thing that the students are that engaged, involved, and stakeholders. The ouch and oops rules, I think somebody referred to something like this. Um, one of the quick things I teach faculty so that they don't avoid difficult dialogues is that if somebody that you could teach your students or whoever you're working with, um, that if somebody says something, it's not that you disagree with it, it is something that is painful to you, and that's a thin line perhaps, but they say something about your people, about you, about people you love. Um, because, I, and again, this is a very long conversation, but I was interested to, to speak with the speaker this morning, the difference between a slur and an idea, right? Calling someone a name is not the same thing as floating an idea. Um, so if somebody says something, and that would be part of your code of conduct, if I were the faculty member, I would have something in there about that. Um, if somebody says something that's painful, uh, people have the right to raise their hand and say, ouch. They don't have to say it on behalf of themselves, they could say it on behalf of somebody else, in their opinion, that has just been injured, actually. Because we're not here to damage people, we're here to engage in maybe deep disagreement without damage. Um, somebody can raise their hand and say, ouch, we stop, we split into listening pairs, I invite people to think out loud in that sacred space that has already been established without interruption and comment from anybody else 
What just happened? Why did somebody raise their hand and say that? Um, I'll give you an example. I did not know that the word gypsy, I mean the word gypped came from the gypsy tradition. I did not know that. And so at some point someone said it in one of my sessions and somebody I think said ouch. And we broke and we learned, right? So, um, and then we invite the people who said ouch to share what is painful about whatever just happened. Depends on how much time you have, how much time you want to give to it. You can dig in a lot deeper, of course, but the other party has the option of raising his or her hand and saying, oops, by which they mean sorry, didn't know it, maybe, didn't get it, won't do it again, we'll find out what I need to so that I don't do it again. And the entire discussion doesn't have to then become about what just happened. Right, so that the class can go on, but people are acknowledged, because the worst thing that can happen when somebody does something hurtful and damaging, particularly in the classroom, is for nothing to be acknowledged. Uh, quickly, you can set up language monitors. You can invite groups of students or participants or faculty or whoever you're working with, a diverse group of people, to pay attention to the language that people use. And at the end of the discussion or the class or what have you, they report to the group without pointing out who said what that when you use this particular phrase, it was problematic for this particular reason. So people learn without being put on the spot, okay? And you can do perception checks. You can teach students. I heard you say that when we do this with affirmative action, you think it means X, is that what you meant? And they can say, oh my gosh, no, right? Or yeah, that's exactly what I meant. And then the discussion goes on. I'll show you just for example of different locales. Uh, we teach Alaska Native Discourse Values through the indigenous work and they have a whole set of things. This is not every single nation up there, but this is one nation. And the one that I find most interesting is the one that says do not voice disagreement or use violent words. Say something positive about the previous speaker and then simply add your thoughts. So when the elders speak, one may get up and say, I think we need to do this about the fishery and I don't think X, Y, Z should happen and I think maybe we need to move so and so out of that role. And the next person gets up and he says, you know, Mary is a wise and devoted uh, woman. She is a culture bearer. She treats her children well. She shares the harvest that she gets with her berries. She's an amazing mother and you should take seriously everything she says. And then he says exactly the opposite position. The premise is that you can damage someone's spirit the way we interact with each other, even in ways that we think are minor, like you're wrong, I disagree, that kind of language. Um, because in indigenous cultures, they know that they need each other and that the relationships matter more than the disagreement or being right. So um, that's a very interesting point when you contrast it to what you see on US television. Um, anything anybody wants or needs to say at this point before we hurtle along? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. We're talking about or we're explaining to us was this, the code of conduct that, we, that the students need to establish. And I tell you, time and time again, when I, I set up that kind of an activity, one of the things that I get from the students at the end of the semester in the student evaluation is, Dr. Varner doesn't teach the class, we teach each other, right? There. Right. Um, so how do, you, how do you deal with um, the framing of, it's an educational, setting in which the teacher is, is, is regarded as the primary person of, that's supposed to impart knowledge, right. um, but is also inviting um, voices that might not necessarily want to be uh, recognized. Yeah. A couple quick thoughts. Um, one is, again, I come from an indigenous perspective, um, and they talk all the time about self-empowerment as a learner that one of the downsides to the dominant culture's way of educating people is it disempowers them. It makes them think that they learn from an authority and that we give our power away all of the time, that we actually need to be helping people realize their own agency, that that's part of our job. And so if I were in your shoes, I would make that very explicit to all of my learners at the beginning, that part of my job is not content, it is process. And it is process to 
uh, and what they're afraid of has uh, oftentimes to do with your grading, right? That they want you to tell them uh, what they have to do to get the good grade. But I would make that very explicit as part of my teaching, that I am not only teaching you the content of my course, I am teaching you a process by which you reclaim your capacity as a thinker, as a leader, as a learner, and I expect you to do it, and you'll be, you know, that's part of what I'm watching, is how well you do that. Um, and I, I am teaching you that, you know, that's part of the content of this course. So that's one thought. The other thought has to do with administrators um, recognizing that in particular, and not just with that, but with any work with difficult dialogues, you're gonna get more complaints if you're doing your job well. Um, oftentimes, there's going to be student complaints about what we're doing because it's out of the mainstream orthodox thing. We're trying to encourage people to think for themselves. We're trying to encourage people to engage in stuff that's challenging to them, uncomfortable for them. When I was in South Africa, I spent eight hours a day training faculty and the other eight hours of the day uh, doing back politicking with the administrators. Not a joke. I didn't expect it, I can tell you that. But that is what I did because there was so much concern on the part of the faculty that if they did what we were asking them to do, there'd be kickback from the students and it would come down on them. Um, so part of the answer to that is to have a conversation with your dean yes. and say, this is what I'm doing. Um, and so it may come out in my student evaluations and I want your backing. Anyway, there's a lot more to say, but I hope that's a tiny bit helpful. Okay, so um, we're gonna dive into yet another exercise. Um, actually, I'm not going to. I'm going to do this next one. This one. I'm going to take you right into the deep end of the pool. We've gone from the, easy, the the listening pairs and the code of conduct. I think anybody can do, on some level. Everybody can do those. This one's uh, further into the deep end of the pool, um, and what it what it does for faculty is it allows you to essentially engage in in, in essence a debate, uh, without again, derailing their whole program, or yours, whatever you're doing, right? Um, the idea behind this is that in a group like ourselves, I would teach you the five minute rule and then you would be invited um, to evoke it when you thought it was necessary. So if we're having a discussion, say we're having a discussion about affirmative action, and somebody in the room notices that all of us are in agreement <laughs> about affirmative action. It's necessary, it must persist, and we need to do various things with it, and strengthen it, and so forth and so on. And someone could call at that moment for the five minute rule. And they would no have noticed that another perspective that exists in the world, maybe even in this room, um, is being either marginalized or dismissed or not even acknowledged at all. And so for five minutes, we would entertain that position and say their position is that class matters more at this point than race in terms of equity issues. And that that should take ascendancy. Okay, that's what they want to talk about, okay? So for five minutes, we would put that up on the wall and only people who can speak supportively to that viewpoint are invited to share. Other people are invited to witness, okay? And there's a series of questions, I will give them to you and people are invited to respond to those questions. They don't have to believe the viewpoint they are representing. They are simply sharing supportively about a position that has, is being entertained, okay? So I'm gonna ask you to entertain, let's see, these are the questions. What's interesting or helpful about this view? What are some intriguing features that others might not have noticed? This is all in the free book, so you don't have to worry too much about writing them all down. What would be different if you believed this view, accepted it as true? And in what sense and under what conditions might this idea be true? Okay? So those are the questions. I'll return to them. Here's the proposition I'll propose that we entertain for five minutes. Okay? So just reflect for a second on that position, which is a very active one on campuses across the nation these days, including mine. That's the proposition. And so those of you who could speak supportively to this position in response to these four questions are invited to raise your hand or go to the mic and shout them out. Um, what's interesting or helpful about that view? What are some intriguing features others might not have noticed? What would be different if you believed that we should have open carry or concealed guns on our campuses or in our classes? And in what sense and under what conditions might that idea be a good one? Okay. 
guns should be allowed on campuses and in classes, whether concealed or open. Do I have to preface with a private university, of course, the, not of course, the, that we don't have this, but when I've talked to folks, I live in Texas, and so a lot of guns. Yeah. Um, but I've talked to folks in the fourth point. Yeah. Um, I've talked with faculty members who felt that they were threatened had threatening experiences with students. Yeah. Um, students who followed them to their cars, sent them violent emails, et cetera, and they said, by the time I get out to my car and someone's waiting there, uh, there won't be enough time for the police response if someone's gonna commit violence, particularly women faculty. Yep. And they said, you know, if, if I was allowed to, to have a concealed weapon in, in my vehicle, which is prohibited at our campus in general, they said they would feel a lot safer Thank you. Great. Hi, I think um, this illuminates where this viewpoint comes from is people's uh, fear in their everyday lives and just how much fear people have that they feel like they have to have a gun at all times. Uh, and so I think uh, one of the questions with this is illuminate. I think it, it, it helps you understand just exactly how much fear there, there is people uh, Great, thank you. You have both done a beautiful job. From here on out, I'm gonna ask you to represent the viewpoint as if it were your own, whether it is or not. Okay? The only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good woman with a gun. And I have a concealed handgun license and military, previous military experience, and I feel perfectly qualified to handle firearm in my classroom. Thank you. You're doing a great job, everybody. Here's somebody over here. I also have a concealed carry permit. I believe that this allows in, in our classrooms to talk about some of the other pieces that come with this, some of the conservative viewpoints that often are predicated that come out, that are the basis of this viewpoint that could allow open Thank you. Let's take one more, if somebody's got one. It matches my outfit. It matches his outfit. He has a blue gun. <clears throat> okay, so you get the idea. Um, so let's talk for a moment about what that was like. Yeah, loud and clear as you can. institution that they register guns for hunting at the police station on campus. Mm -hmm. So um, not the same type of context, but a situation where guns are allowed. Yeah. So different cultural aspects um, I think should be taken into consideration. My own personal viewpoints, my parents have concealed carry and yeah. um, lifelong gun permits due yeah. to a recent incident in the past couple, past couple of years of an armed robbery Home. Yep. And so I think it's difficult to address that situation I'm thinking about in my work environment. Would I be comfortable if a student had a gun um, and I'm sitting and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them? Great, thank you. What was the process like for other folks? I'm making a wild assumption that a bunch of you don't hold this position. What was that like for some of people in that group? Woman behind you, Nancy. I think it's eye opening because when you think of those that carry and uh, have concealed weapons, you get an automatic picture of who that might look like, mm. what their personality mm. might be. This personalizes it and it makes you think, if you don't support it, it makes you think about it in a different context mm. of, oh, I understand. And when you tell a story about the faculty, it's like, that makes Thank you. Okay. Great. I think it's kind of interesting to hear the perspective on why this is necessary. Clearly, mm -hmm. um, I don't hold that view, but uh, I have a son who talked to me about applying for a permit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's difficult to have that conversation, particularly in the environment where we had an incident where a gun was concealed, which 
then I have to sit and talk to them. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, and I kind of look at it from other countries and see what kind of gun laws they have. So it is, you know, it is a very difficult conversation. Yeah. I can understand, empathize with perspectives that some of them have here. Yeah. Um, but when I personalize it, I don't know how to deal with it. Yeah, okay, thank you. One more? not at all, I think, maybe what it would have been 10 years ago, right. because I've just lived in an environment where it's very different, it's very normal, kids are out hunting, kids are out, they're learning how to manage guns, they're in homes, and it, it's just a very different attitude toward it all, yep. so I think whatever one's perspective on the issue is really comes from the context that you've been in, and sort of what you've heard, or, or the familiarity with you have, that you have with it, because that shapes then how you respond to that, which to me was just like, Right. Of Where they come from. Comfort. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So you get the idea, all right? And I've done this on a whole bunch of topics. I was with a bunch of human rights activists. We did it on marriage should be between one man and one woman. Um, I was down working with the faculty at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, no, um, I'm sorry. I went to um, University of Virginia. The person who was hosting me, I said, "What should we talk about?" She said, "We just passed a law that limits you to one gun a month." I said, okay, <laughs> sounds fun. Um, did it with the faculty, maybe 60 of them. They couldn't do it with a straight face. <clears throat> I kept giving them the instructions and they kept not doing it. And I kept saying, I, I need you to actually take this seriously the way that you would if you were in a classroom with your students. And they couldn't. And then I'd say, okay, I'd give them the instruction again. And I finally said, y you really need to know that not everybody in this room agrees with you. You think they do, they don't. I can promise you, right, based on my experience, they don't. So they finally started doing the exercise, and um, sure enough, the people who came from very different class backgrounds started to feel the right to speak, and the whole game changed. And people began to realize, of course, most of us are in white middle class cultures in academia, and that that was not the experience of, I mean, that's not the only group. Um, anyways. It's a super interesting exercise. Um, I always invite people at the end to, you know, after five minutes you get to return to your previous biases. Um, but one of the um, important pieces we get out of it is what is it like to sit through five minutes where I'm not assuming everybody disagrees with this position, but many of you do. How uncomfortable is that? Or to voice viewpoints you don't actually share. And then you think of the evangelical student in a class on evolution for 16 weeks, right? So it just gives us a moment, for some of us at least, and to begin to expand our own viewpoints. We think of ourselves as very, very open-minded as a rural university context, and then we'll discover many places where we're just maybe not so much, right? So again, lots to say about this one, but I wanted you to get just a touch of a flavor of it. And then we're going to go into something even more interesting in some ways, um, modular debate. So these are sort of ways of having quote unquote debates where you get to see multiple perspectives or, or at least two perspectives that you might not have been seeing in a classroom or in another setting. Modular debate, you identify an issue, you frame the proposition, you identify constituencies with different positions on that issue, you assign or select people to be representing those constituencies. I will ask you to do this. You have them identify positions and then you conduct a debate. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you two, two um, positions to look at. The first one I've been doing with folks around the country. The second one, I'm going to take some liberties with you. So this is one we've been doing a lot. Okay. Um, the demographics are changing in our country of student bodies most places and the faculty not so much. So, um, so just for kicks, who would be the stakeholders in that dialogue? Who cares? What are the groups that care? Students, Students. faculty, alumni. alumni, alumni, yeah. Administrators don't care, but we'll put them in there anyway. 
Who else? Parents. Parents. Graduate students. Graduate students. Donors. Admission offices. The board. the board. The greater community, right? We can go on. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a liberty with you here because um, I have spent most of my life working on indigenous justice issues, right? And when I listen to the <laughs> elders, um, the most important issue is that we address the preservation of our life support systems so that all the other struggles may go on. And in higher ed these days, we are rightly focusing an ex extraordinary amount of our attention, as we must, and even more than we are now, on the incredible equity issues in this country that must be addressed immediately. Um, at the same time, since I come from where I come from, and we have had three snowless winters in Alaska, let me repeat, three snowless winters in the state of Alaska, not just this last winter, but the three that preceded it, we are on the front lines of the climate emergency. And I do difficult dialogues all around the world, and I can pretty much promise you no one is talking about this. Um, and it's an environmental justice issue that's going to take, uh, that's gonna hit people, most vulnerable people hardest, and it already is. So I'm gonna invite you to launch into something you're probably not as familiar with, um, and that's okay. So we're gonna look at that issue. Universities should devote the necessary resources to ensure that within three years, their operations and curricula serve as models for responding to the climate emergency. So who would be the stakeholders in this discussion? Faculty? Community and media. Administrators. Administrators. Municipal planners? Physical, 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 plan. physical plan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Legislators. Legislators. The board. The board, exactly. Donors, alumni, students, parents, right? Um, yeah, right. Four legged, two legged, swimming people. Okay, so we've got a whole host of stakeholders, future generations, anybody born today and going out from here, right? And even before. So um, we're gonna do a super abridged version of this as well. So you are going to be anybody born today and out from here. Uh, you can be wildlife, you can be the board, you can be faculty, you can be students, you can be donors back there, you can be alumni, uh, who am I missing? The physical plant, parents, right? Students, everybody got something? Did I give you, yeah. Okay, so you're gonna take five minutes, that's all I'm gonna give you. Your task is this, what's your position on this issue? Are you for it? Are you against it? Or are you split? And why? Um, so I'm just gonna briefly kind of model how this would go, right? At this point, I would be inviting different groups to speak about their position. Let me just check in. Board, what's your position? For, against, or split? For the board, sorry. Uh, I was, we're, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, we're split, but for, with oh. some parameters. Okay, all right. So what we would do if we had more time was I would invite them to speak about that, and other groups staying in character would be invited to inquire about various things, ask them, press them, uh, question them on things, and there's a structure for doing that outlined in the book, right? Uh, future generations starting now, what's your position on this? Ryan Marsh has got to do it. Okay, Stop. four. Stop making excuses. Okay, all right. <laughs> so we would have them speak, and we would have that same invitation. Uh, Faculty, where are you on this one? Deeply ambivalent. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Could you be anything else? <laughs> I would not have even honored it if it weren't so, right? Okay, so you get how this would work. 
and in the book it outlines the way to do it. The advantage to this is it models for your students that there are complexities to every policy thing. There's never two sides to anything in reality. It engages all of them. And like the last uh, exercise, they get to be anonymous in their viewpoint. One of the reasons students don't engage in dialogues because they feel too vulnerable. One of the reasons adults don't. I mean, you know, mature adults don't is for the same reason, right? So this allows them to have the discussion, have the ideas on the floor without putting their personal opinions on the line. So we won't unpack it further than that. I'm gonna just run for it on this one because somebody raised this issue with me yesterday. The question of what happens in our classrooms where somebody makes a discriminatory remark, what is it, which is unintentional but is also unacceptable. Um, I just want to quickly let you know there's a process that came from the National Coalition Building Institute. It's a three-part process. The first part goes like this. Somebody says something like in my campus, they would say, why do Alaska Native people get free medical care? Very common, unintentionally racist question. It surfaces all the time. And the faculty member's first job is, or whoever's job, is to acknowledge that it was said, which we often don't. Um, I appreciate that issue being surfaced. Many people share that sentiment. I'm glad it gives us a chance to talk about it. Point number two, the hard part, digging for the positive intention behind the comment. I work with faculty to practice this, or again, I keep saying faculty, but you know, if you know your constituency, you know the kinds of things they're likely to say <laughs> by now, many of you, right? Or get with people who can imagine with you what they might say and practice the response to this next piece. So the positive intention is, I understand that you're concerned about health care access and equity. I share that concern. And the third piece is accurate information. As it happens, Native folks traded land for the health care that they get. Our buildings and our university are on their lands in exchange for which they have a federally underfunded health care system. It's not free. Um, that's the process, one, two, three, that you respond to those kinds of remarks, but you need to practice them beforehand. So I just wanted to mention at the end of all difficult dialogues, it's a wise thing to do to do a feedback form of some kind. Anonymous is also, is often terrific in any setting. People will tell you what they think if it's anonymous. I collect them, I come back, I have a series of questions, you can make up your own. Um, these come out of a book, but you could find your own. Um, and then I report back to the group. If I'm meeting with them again, here's what you said, and here's what I did, or here's what I'm not gonna do, and here's why. So they know you're in conversation with them about the conversation itself. Um, that'll do it, I, I think, actually. Um, I just wanna mention we do have a um, conference that happens every two years. Um, there will be one in fall of 2018, place to be determined for the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center that does this work across the country for institutions wrestling with these issues. Uh, this was the one last year at the University of Michigan. Bev Tatum was our keynote. Uh, I like this quotation, the purpose of a university is to make students safe for ideas, not ideas safe for students. And there are lots of resources. I can leave this PowerPoint for you to consult if you need it. Thanks very much. It's um, been really great to be here. And I will be whisked away to Chicago very shortly. So I um, really appreciated my time with you. <laughs>